I'm still constantly amazed as, I, as we look at these time-lapse videos that somebody, that's actually somebody's job to build Lego, Lego models. Each week we've been looking at a different Lego build in time-lapse fashion. Uh, and, and it's a reminder for us of the way we're thinking about our core values. We're in the series on our values, being God's people by design. Uh, and, and when we think about our values like being building blocks that, that shape our identity and empower our mission and our vision. Each value that we've gone through each week is a different building block. And we bring them all together. We live them out to become the people God designed us to be. Today's value that we're, that we're talking about in depth is this, people of grace. That we are people of grace. That's an essential building block for us. In other words, grace leads all of our relationships. It's not just a little sprinkle here or there. It's not a little ingredient. It leads all of our relationships, beginning with ourselves and God, beginning with our families, our spouses, who we are as a congregation in our relationships, and then out from there. People of grace. And as I said, it's a building block that empowers our mission. Let me remind you again of our mission and our vision. Our mission is very simple. It's to follow Christ and share His grace. Grace is used in the mission itself. That is what we are to do. Our vision is the outcome, the, the preferred sort of outcome that we have for ourselves, that God wants for you and me and for all people. That's our vision. And that's individuals, families, and communities thriving in God's grace. Again, grace is, is implied in the vision and in our mission. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. Think about the, uh, that vision and realizing that vision in your life, in our church, in our community, in our nation, in our world. If we believe that this is what God has designed us to do and to be, that this is the product, this is where he's leading us, I want to ask you a couple of important questions. If this is the outcome that God wants for us, think about our country. Is our country united and thriving in God's grace? It's a rhetorical question, I know. Is our country united and thriving? In, I mean, if we believe as the people of God sitting here right now that this is God's vision for all people, we just said it. What kind of work do we have to do? All right, let me break it down a little bit more with that first question, okay? Uh, let's just let's make it a little easier. Is our state united and thriving in God's grace? All right, let's go maybe make it a little... How about our county? Is our county united? Okay, how about Stewart? How about our city? Is our city united and thriving in God's... All right, how about your neighborhood? How about your... Is your neighborhood united and thriving? Maybe your family. Is your family... You see... All this represents a great need, a great need. And that leads to the second question. Who do you expect to model or lead the way of grace? Who do you expect is going to, do you think, raise hands if you think the politicians are going to lead the way of grace for our country, for our state, our county, your neighborhood? No hands are going up. Okay, how about corporate America? How about private enterprise? Anybody for that? Mm. Um, how about your HOA? Anybody's HOA going to do it? No. Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, great cookies, but they're not going to lead the way of grace, right? It's rhetorical. Who, who is given the task of leading a life of grace, of leading people into the grace of Jesus Christ? Who? The church. The church. This is... This is our calling. This is the vision that God has given to you and to me. The world around us will not be united and thrive in God's grace, which is our vision, without the church leading the way. This is you and me. And this is, this is where the rubber meets the road, guys. It's not just a concept. It's not just something that you know, we kind of you know, clap for Jesus to do beyond us. And we can look to the very beginning days of the church to see a model for how this actually looked. In Acts chapter 4. Let me share this with you. This is a little, this is almost like a little dear diary entry. Day three of the church. Here's what happened. And, and so listen to how it reads. In Acts 4, it says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. 
they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. Underline that. God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. But from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, I want, to, I want you to see the centerpiece of this little story. This is a very practical thing that they were doing to embody and to live out grace. And, and it says, God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. Other translations say, much grace was upon them all, or great grace was was upon them all. The word for powerfully or much or great is a great Greek word I want to share with you. It's the Greek word megale. Megale. I love that word, megale, because what word do you hear in there? Mega. Mega. So if I were to translate this in English, I'd say don't use great or much or powerfully. Just use the word mega. I mean, mega, it communicates something much bigger than just merely great or powerful. Mega is, well, it's mega, right? You can't get better than the word mega. Mega, what makes it mega? It's mega because it's from God, not from us. Grace is not something we can conjure up. Grace is not from us, it's from God. That's what makes it so. So it starts with God, not with what we do, not with what, how we earn it or deserve it, anything like that. It all comes from God. That's what makes it mega. But I want you to notice how grace is intensely practical. It's not just a concept here. We have to think of grace as this kind of this idea that we apply to our lives. This is intensely practical because you see the vision that was realized through this grace. It describes it right at the beginning. They were of one heart and one mind. We just kind of unpack the fact that there really aren't many people around us in our world that are of one heart and one mind, right? We have a lot of division. We have a lot of dissension in our worlds at every level. And so here it is. This powerful mega grace made them of one heart and one mind. Not of their own doing. They all had differences of opinion too. They were no different than us. But the difference was God's mega grace coming in, this power uniting them, one heart and one mind. It led them to selfless sharing. You see that? Very practical stuff going on here. They began to see their stuff differently and their connection to others differently, not because of their own opinions and perspectives, but because of this mega grace that infected them. You see this incredible overflow of generosity and encouragement. Even one person's name was changed to Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. When, when God's grace comes upon you and me, there's a sense in which our names are changed so that we become encouragers. We sang about hope earlier, didn't we? What a beautiful name it is, Jesus. And, and when the world needs the hope of Jesus, the world needs our encouragement. Where does it start? We can't, we can't depend on the politicians or corporate America or Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, right? It starts here. It starts right here. We need to think of the church in different ways. And here's some metaphors to kind of work with. Think of the church as a kind of training ground for grace. It's football season, and every football team has its own training facility. That's not where they play their games, but that's where they do most of their work. This is where they prepare for the big day, the big game in the stadium. It's their training facility where they they get it right together before they go out into their opposition. And, And the church is no different. Why are you here right now? This is a training facility, a training ground for you and me to learn to be people of grace with one another. Because listen, if we can't get it together with one another, be of one heart and one mind, how in the world are we going to take it into a crazy, dark, divided world out there? This is our training ground. Here's another way of thinking of the church. The church is a factory to produce mass quantities of grace. You go to the Ford factory, and you're going to see one Ford one. F-150, F-150, right? F-150 after another being mass produced, pumped out. And there's an intense focus on how to make that Ford F-150. And what is, what is our product here? The primary product that God wants to produce in and through us together and for the world in mass quantities is grace. 
It's grace. Or think of the, think of the church as a hospital, uh, a birthing unit in a hospital where, where grace is being born. You know, who doesn't like a beautiful newborn baby as long as you don't have to take it home, right? <laughs> as long as it's somebody else's, right? But babies represent this, this freshness, this, this innocence, this purity, this new start. They are a blank tablet, right? And, and a new life is happening. And that's what happens when we gather as the body of Christ. God wants to birth something new in us and through us together. It starts here together. Something's being born anew in us through His Spirit. Or one final metaphor to think of the church. Think of the church as an artist's canvas on which is a beautiful painting of God's grace. A blank canvas. Every time we gather together, God wants to paint something beautiful in your heart, in your mind, in our relationships, so that it might be shared with others because it's life-giving. So if we think of the church, this is our calling, this is the vision, I want to ask us some tough questions. One of these questions comes from John Oatberg. He asks it this way. Why is it that churches filled with people who say they are, have been saved by grace can become such ungracious people? Why? If we are saved by grace, if grace is our main identity and it's the main thing that we are called to give away in Christ, why is it that at any level we are ungracious with one another and with others? Or here's another way of framing it. Why is it if you ask someone outside the church what they associate with the word Christian, they might mention conservative political agenda or judgmentalism or self-righteousness, but not grace filled love. Why? Why? I ask you, why? Story of a prostitute. She was a drug addict, ruining her life, and her addiction was so very bad, she couldn't keep up the habit. She couldn't make enough money on her own as a prostitute, and so what she did was something absolutely abhorrent. She sold her two-year-old daughter into prostitution because then she could make a lot more money. How sick and sadistic is that? And so she's reaching out for help. And amidst all the resources to help her kind of pull her life and save her daughter and pull it all together, one person says, have you considered going to church? To which she says, church? Why in the world would I go there? I already feel so terrible about myself they would only make it worse. Would they? Would we? I'm reminded of the joke, uh, it's, it's funny and yet it's not, of the sinner who's excommunicated and forbidden from the church and he complains to the Lord in prayer, Lord, they won't let me in the church because I'm a sinner to which God replies, well, what are you complaining about? They won't let me in either. Yeah, kind of dark humor, isn't it? Those stories underscore for us how important it is. Listen, guys, it's so important to be people of grace because those are real. Those are real dynamics. In the presence of sin and sinners at Stuart Congregational Church, you know what it does? It unleashes the mega power of God's grace. It unleashes the mega power of God's grace. We don't hide our sin. We don't celebrate sin. Hear me. Hear me, we are not justifying or celebrating sin, but what we are celebrating is God's constant promise and response in the face of our sin. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 5 in terms of that response. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Do you get that? Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Grace always stays ahead of the curve. It never, it never gets caught up with by sin. It never, in other words, here's something you can write down. You cannot out God's grace. You cannot out God's grace. This is not a justification for sin. It's not a license for sin. But it's the truth. It's a fact. It's the gospel. You cannot out God's grace. You can't top God's grace with your sin. Even a story like the one I shared about the prostitute and the two-year-old. When I was in Starting out in ministry, I started out doing youth ministry, and our, our youth started playing a game when we would go away to conferences at mealtime, at lunchtime, 
And it was actually kind of disgusting. And so I, I don't recommend this. I, actually, I demand that our youth not do this. But it was a game called Top It, the Top It game. And um, they would go like to a salad bar and they make a salad with all the salad fixings. And then one of them would say, okay, top it. And they'd like pour ketchup on it and eat it. And the next one, in order to top it, would go, all right, they're going to make the same salad with the same ketchup, but put something else, like, you know, mayonnaise or mustard on it and eat it and then say, top it. And it would escalate and go on and on. And it would get really gross. And they would actually put things that were not edible on it. And it was, I don't even want to describe it. It was this game of top it. We can never top. God's grace. As depraved and as horrible as people can be, as things are in our world, God's grace is better. God never says you, can, you, you just stepped past the limits of my grace. Why? Because His grace is unlimited. You can never exhaust the limits of God's grace. That's what makes it God's grace. Listen to the way Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your perfection. Oh, I didn't say that, did it? My power is made perfect in your piety. My power is made perfect in your faith and your biblical knowledge and your ability to quote verse after verse. No. My power is made perfect, not somewhat okay, perfect in your weakness. Do you get this? Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. When's the last time you boasted about your weaknesses? Think about that. Why? So that Christ's power may rest on me. You will have the power of Christ resting on you in your weaknesses, not in your strength, not in your triumphs, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, in your weaknesses. This is the way God's grace works in you and me. It's an amazing promise. When we admit our sin and weakness, then we can harness the mega power of God's grace for us to thrive, for us to flourish, and then we begin to share that with others. You ever heard the phrase, falling from grace? Falling from grace? We never fall from grace with God. But we need to learn how to fall in grace. How to fall into grace. How to fall with grace. How to fall gracefully. Are you with me? When I was a kid, uh, uh, probably like second to fifth grade actually, so I was a little guy. I, uh, I took judo. I was actually very good, uh, really good. I won medals in tournaments, and uh, I, I actually learned how to throw a 200-pound man as a little guy. So don't tick me off, okay? <laughs> I'm telling you right now. I can lay you out. Uh, judo is interesting because judo is not karate. It's not hitting, chopping, kicking, anything like that. It is, it is learning leverage against your opponent using their own body weight, their own momentum against them. And so you can throw people that are twice your size and twice your weight to the ground. Uh, you, you can trip them and, and so on and so forth. So you might think in judo, you know, you're learning all these techniques for how to throw someone. You know what the very first thing is you learn how to do in judo? Fall. That's just one of the exercises that's a diagram for learning how to fall gracefully. The very first thing you do is not offensive. It's how you fall gracefully. Do you, do you think that you fall any in your life? Yeah. Are we fallen people? Yeah, we are. In judo, you learn how to fall. Why? Because go to the next slide. This is why. Because you get thrown quite violently and quite easily. As soon as you step outside the doors of our church, there'll be something at one point or another that throws you, won't there? There'll be some trip up that you'll have, and how will you and I fall? We can't stick our heads in the sand and say we're not going to fall. Do we fall as people of grace, gracefully, or not? How do we model this to a world that is fallen? This is the opportunity before us. You see, when grace leads our relationships, we help one another fall in grace, not fall from grace. Are you with me? We help one another fall in grace. We don't condemn one another. We don't judge one another. We help one another fall in grace, not fall from grace. Again, let me remind you, this is not a license for sin. Because that's one of the things people can often be a stickler. Oh, this grace, you know, give people permission to do whatever they want. No, 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 no. That's not it whatsoever. 
Let me give you some perspective from uh, Philip Yancey, who wrote a wonderful book called What's So Amazing About Grace. And this is the way he put it. He said, church should be a haven for people who feel terrible about themselves. Theologically, that is our ticket for entry. God needs humble people, which usually means humbled people, to accomplish his work. Whatever makes us feel superior to other people is not grace. Did you hear that? Whatever makes us feel superior to other people is not grace. Humility is what he's describing. Humility requires that we swallow our pride. Pride is the crown of all the seven deadly sins. Everything comes out of pride. We need to swallow the pride, our spiritual pride, our religious pride, our biblical pride. We need to swallow our moral pride. In fact, it's very biblical. James says this in chapter 4, verse 6. But he gives us more grace, mega grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud. That's a That's a tough statement, guys. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Shows favor to the humble. Uh, This idea of pride can trip us up, and we're not even aware of it. I'm reminded of a very prideful CEO of a Fortune 500 company who was driving with his wife. This was in New Jersey, and they had to stop and get gas. One of the things that's unique about New Jersey and Oregon uh, is that they pump gas for you. You can't get out of your car. So they pull in. This guy is, you know, the gas station attendant. He's pumping their gas. So this executive's wife notices that this this gas station attendant was a guy she dated in high school. Oh, my gosh. She gets out to say hello and get reacquainted with John from high school, and they chat. He finishes pumping the gas. She gets back in the car, and her husband, this prideful CEO, is sitting there smirking. And he says, I bet I know what you're thinking right now. But you're thinking you're sure glad you didn't date this guy, a gas station attendant. To which she says, no. Actually, uh, I was sort of thinking that if I had been dating him, he'd be a Fortune 500 executive. (laughs) Pride. Humility. Listen to this. Humility demands that you take no credit. No credit for the mega grace of God that rescues you to thrive. You and I are rescued to thrive. That's how we started out talking about God's vision for us and all people. It's not by our doing. It's not by our boasting. This is the grace of God. What is the grace that we're actually talking about? Let me give you a few working definitions. If you want to write these down, that could be helpful for you to refer back to. Stick it in your Bible and and, uh, they can be a help. Grace. Here are a few, few definitions. One is this. Grace is the power of God to rescue you. Now, Contrast that to religion. You know what religion is? Religion is your own attempts to rescue yourself. This is why grace is so unique for us in our theology. Grace. Here's one from John Calvin. I love this one. Grace is undeserved favor, unmerited affection. That goes back to the 16th century. Undeserved favor, unmerited affection. Apply that to yourself. Here's a third one. Grace is everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. Everything for nothing for those who don't deserve anything. Here's a fourth one. Grace is the limitless kindness of God meeting the helpless spiritual poverty of people. Do you see yourself as helpless? Do you see yourself as not deserving, as having unmerited favor? Do you see what that, rep- that, that all represents humility, doesn't it? No, pride cannot exist with any of these definitions of grace. Philip Yancey once again sheds some light, and this is what he says about grace. He says, grace means there is nothing we can do to make God love us more, and there's nothing we can do to make God love us less. I want you to think about that for a second. Let that sit with you. You can't add to God's love for you by being a better person, being more faithful. You can't diminish God's love for you by being a worse person, more of a sinner. God's grace just is. So Paul puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. A gift, by definition, is not something you earn or deserve, right? A gift is a gift that comes from someone, and it's simply there for you. There is no boasting about a gift. It's not something that you acquire in any sense whatsoever. The unique gift of Christianity to the world is the gift of grace in Jesus Christ. 
It's the unique thing about us. In fact, think about it this way. All religions have truth claims, but only Christianity has grace claims. We have truth claims and grace claims. All other religions have truth claims. This, this, is, this is born out, of course, through Jesus. And uh, I'm reminded of the story of, of C.S. Lewis. We all love C.S. Lewis. You know, he wrote Chronicles of Narnia and we have the Narnia films and Mere Christianity and all that good stuff. He was at a conference of comparative religions, world religions. And all these scholars were gathered and they were asking the question, wrestling over the question, what makes Christianity unique? And they're all talking about, well, maybe it's the incarnation, you know, God coming in the flesh. And one says, no, there are other mythologies and religions that depict the, an incarnation of the deity. Well, maybe it's uh, redemption, this idea of dying and for someone else and redeeming them. No, there are other religions that have that too. Well, maybe it's resurrection. No, that, that is not unique to Christianity, believe it or not. C.S. Lewis was not in a part of this conversation, but he stuck his head in the door and said, what's all the fuss about in here? They told him, we're trying to figure out what's unique about Christianity amidst all world religions. He, had, he said, oh, that's easy. It's grace. Simple and quick as that. It's grace. It's grace. That's what we have to offer that no one else has why is this so central for us as a value, as a building block? Because that's what makes us unique. And that's what we see uniquely in Jesus himself. Not just teachings of scripture, but embodied in Jesus. Listen to what John says in first chapter, verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Truth claims, just like every other religion, but also grace claims, unlike every other religion. You know what grace and truth do for you and me through Jesus? Grace and truth balance the reality we deserve, which is Christ's death, with the reality we receive, which is new life in Christ. Guys, the world needs to know that kind of hope. The world will not know it apart from us because we have this unique grace claim. This is how we experience the goodness of God and how we give away the goodness of God. Thomas Merton put it this way. A saint. A saint is not someone who is good, but who experiences the goodness of God. You ever thought about it that way? You and I, as we experience the goodness of God, that's how we become saints. And so when you experience God's mega goodness, when you experience God's mega kindness, mega mercy, mega forgiveness, when you and I experience God's mega grace, you know what happens? You and I naturally overflow with grace. You and I naturally become persons of grace. You and I naturally, it's not, it's not a chore, we let grace lead our relationships. When you and I experience God's mega grace, we give God the credit for rescuing us. We have nothing to do with that. When you and I experience this mega grace, you and I naturally have one heart and one mind as believers. We're united, even though we can differ, even though we have different personalities, right? When you and I experience this mega grace, you know what happens? You begin to share more selflessly. You, you become a more generous person. You become a Barnabas. You become a more encouraging person to one another in the church, to your family, to your friends, to strangers, and people you don't like. When you and I experience God's mega grace, you more naturally humble yourself before the God who will never let you fall from grace, but always wants you to fall in grace. Can I get an amen? This is why this building block is so essential. It's so gospel-centric for us. People of grace. People of grace. That's the building block that is God's gift to us and through us to the whole world. Let's pray together. We are humbled, Lord Jesus, not only by what you have done for us, but by what you want to do in and through us. Remove any spiritual pride, any ego, any claim that we have to our own goodness, our own faithfulness, and replace it 
with your power, with your presence, with your goodness, and come alive in us. Lead us, lead us with your grace into our relationships with one another so that this might be the training ground of grace for all of our relationships in the world. Infect us with your grace. Lord, shape our families, shape our, 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 our small group Bible studies, shape our interactions before and after worship, shape who we are and how we care for one another by your grace so that this dark, divided world can also share in the hope of grace through us. And glory be only to you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name that we pray this prayer. Amen. Let's all stand together this morning. spoke a word you were singing over me and you had been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me and you had been so, so kind to me, and all oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, and oh, it chases me down, fights still I'm found, leaves the 99, I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it.
mountain you will climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. kick down, lie, you won't tear down, coming after me. Thank you back there. Good job, Tech. Give my hand. Yeah. Um, that's grace, guys. That's grace. And it's also humility on our part to recognize, yeah, we're pretty dark and we're pretty far away, but we're never out of reach from God. And so let's be, let's be God's grace-filled people. It starts here with one another and it goes out from here because the world needs it so badly so desperately you and I are God's plan for the world Jesus wants to work through us and listen it, it starts with admitting our weaknesses admitting our need and if you have a need today it's okay it's a safe place to be in the grace of Jesus and we always have a Stephen minister available following the service and if you feel like you know, God's Spirit is touching you and you'd like to have someone pray with you about a need, an issue, a difficulty, someone walk with you through that. We want to invite you to meet with the Stephen minister following the service and, and simply have a time of prayer. Stephen ministers, they, they invite you to go in an ongoing confidential relationship with them. And that's an option for anyone, for anyone in our church or in our community. But we always have one available immediately following the service. If you just need a moment of prayer, don't hesitate. Sandy Coy will be our Stephen minister today, and Sandy will be over here next to the piano, and she would relish uh, being able to pray with you and walk with you through whatever difficulty you're going through. Don't hesitate to come forward and see Sandy. Beloved, whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, remember to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you and be gracious to you. May the light of the Lord's countenance shine upon your face and give you peace. Go now in peace in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, and all God's children said, Amen. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't No shadow you will light up, mountain you will climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't get down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you will light up, mountain you will climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't. 
every day. 